start with some very quick thanks, and then we'll go on to John's speech, and you'll also see what's coming up for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, first and foremost, to Marvin Taylor and Liz Wiest uh, at the Fails. Marvin's in the back, very unobtrusively, yeah. Marvin, we see you and we thank you. We are always delighted to be here. It's a wonderful library, a wonderful spot, and a jurist who is hosting the wonderful reception afterwards, and we'll give you Janet's address at the end as well. That said... I'm going to switch over here now, and we're going to hop to YouTube and see if you can hear this. This is now you know why the mics are going to be down this low. <laughs> here in the little window on YouTube, and yes, you can seek this out on your own on YouTube. Is this really great? We're mad. We're all mad here. I'm John Shuska. I'm Jim Shuska. Check out my new book, Walt Disney's Howard Hughes. Yeah. You know, when I first heard about the possibility of retelling Alice, I thought that was the coolest thing, because it could be a way to really connect younger kids with the story. Lewis Carroll is one of my favorite writers, and try to do something with Walt Disney is not too, it's a real challenge. Welcome to my tea party. Glad you could be here. <laughs> I think maybe the walrus is my favorite character. <laughs> Just because he so lovingly brings in the little oysters and sings to them. Available now. <laughs> in fact, in limited release, it's available, as they say in theaters, in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Otherwise known as the little table at the back. So John will be doing a signing. We've gotten thank you again to Disney for a lovely discount for members. So we have copies of the book added this morning when I met him for the first time. I met John through giving the book The Stinky Cheese Man to one of our nephews and entered a world of fabulous madness from which I've never fully recovered. And I think that's a good thing. He's written many, many other things, and I especially want to applaud the Guys Read program. And if there's perhaps a moment to speak about that, I think it would be a great thing, because I'll tell you this, we did the Maxine Schaefer reading yesterday at an elementary school. We had 20 children, we had 18 girls, and two boys. This is a spectacular group hanging out here. I don't know, should I call you Carolians? Yep. Yes. Carolinians? <laughs> Caroloids? Carolites? How does that work? Carol people, whoever you are, from all over the place. Um, and I'd like to thank Monica Edinger, um, who you may or may not know, who sort of connected me with this group. And she's just a wonder in the classroom. And I love that she's connected with all of you, and with like getting great books out to kids. Oh, that's, that's yeah. just dramatic. 
So, um, I thought maybe I'd give you a little background of where I started with books, because I don't know how many of you are involved with the children's book world. Um, and then maybe just have a chance to describe how I did this book, Alice, with uh, Kelsey, my editor, and then give you a chance to ask questions, too. And in case you don't have any questions, I usually come pre-equipped. Because <laughs> I've talked to a lot of kids. And my favorites are the classics, really. Like, where do you get your ideas? How much money do you make? <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> and what happened to your hair? <laughs> You'll always get those questions. So feel free to ask those. Um, but I started, and my connection with Lewis Carroll, I think, started as a kid. Um, he's definitely one of my favorite artists because once I discovered him, I realized he did the stuff I liked to do and the stuff that I liked in writing. So as a kid, I grew up in the 60s and was a fan of reading Mad Magazine, uh, watching Rocky and Bullwinkle, um, Looney Tunes cartoons. And it's all that, I think it really is the modern sensibility of Lewis Carroll, which brings his love of parody and satire and humor and real knowledge to a kind of strange and a funny story. And so when I got this chance to be part of Retelling Alice, I just jumped at it. Um, Though I, I think I should have thought about it a little more. Because <laughs> in retrospect, when I started actually working on the thing, I realized all the parts I loved about Lewis Carroll just are almost impossible to do in a picture book. It was like, oh, what was I thinking? job that was available teaching this at the school. Though I should have asked them, like, why there was a job available <laughs> in the middle of the year. Like, what happened to that other first grade assistant? It was because this was a hell class. They were like the craziest bunch of kids. But they were also the most lively bunch of kids I ever saw. Because they were musicians, they saw themselves as artists, they were performers, scientists. They were willing to do everything. So I, I ended up teaching at Parker as one weekly. That's about it. But in the world of kids' books, that's what they live on. And being in the classroom, I found and connected with kids through that humor. And so in my classroom, I was doing things like retelling fairy tales with my kids. But when I took off a year to try to sell that to publishers, it just kind of freaked them out. Like I sent away the manuscript to the true story of the three little pigs. And they just thought, oh no, kids aren't going to understand this. But I think it was only because they didn't understand how smart kids are. And then when I had actually sent off some of the stories to the Stinky Cheese Man, <laughs> though in manuscript form, you can imagine, <laughs> those are even more kind of scary. Because there's stories in here like The Princess and the Bowling Ball, or The Really Ugly Duckling, who grows up to be a really ugly duck. <laughs> <laughs> now, usually when you're sending stuff out, I used to get just form letter rejections. <laughs> but for Stinky Cheese Man, I got some very personal rejections. <laughs> so the usual rejection is a form letter that just says, I'm sorry, this is not quite right for us. Cinderella. So no, no, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. So that became Stinky, which was just messing with every convention of putting a book together, including the end papers, or the title page. <laughs> One of my finest pieces of work right here. <laughs> the title page. I also didn't have to do much work that day. Or the dedication page upside down. And I think somebody like Lewis Carroll definitely would have appreciated this. We were going to print the entire book upside down. I thought that would be funny. <laughs> my editor said, oh no, please don't do that. Because people will storm the offices. And she's so right. Because kids, actually some people do write in and say, like, this page is upside down. <laughs> Even though Jack the narrator is holding it going, I know, I know, it's upside down. He did it on purpose. <laughs> Though our other great idea for this book that didn't happen is we were going to make it a pop-up book also. One, one page of it. And you know how those pop-up books always break anyhow. So we were going to have a tab on it that said, pull tab A. 
and when you pulled it, it would just come off. <laughs> and absolutely nothing would happen, except you'd be holding the tape going, <laughs> Our editor didn't want to do that either. <laughs> but luckily for us, we did get to include the really ugly duckling, who grows up to be <laughs> the really ugly duck. And it's really, I think, kids' favorite stories. I mean, people, adults, some adults were just worried that this would be this too mean or too harsh for them. But I think it's only because they had never been in a classroom with a bunch of kids. Like, they're crazy. This is mild. This is nothing. Like, and they love the details of the type growing up. I've had kids write in and explain to me, like, sort of the visual technique, which I think is wonderful, and the design. I think that's a place where kids are now, that they're much more sophisticated about design and image. So there are people who can appreciate something like a, a great drawing. Or the design of all the ducks being the same on the side, and then on the next page they're exactly the same. It's just that like the duck's bigger, the little hunk of drool hanging off his beak is a little bigger. <laughs> so after that, um, I mean I just my sort of built my career on just messing around with all kinds of forms. I mean that's really what I love to do. I love, and that's what I love about Lewis Carroll, that he was such a parodist and a satirist. That, and then people don't even understand that, I think, in this age. They don't even know the poems that are being parodied, which is fine in some ways. I mean, I had that same argument with people who said kids couldn't understand something like the true story of the three little pigs if they didn't know the original. But I said, you know what, I think I saw fairy tales first on TV. I grew up as a kid in the 60s and saw Rocky and Bullwinkle, Fractured Fairy Tales, even quite translated how it's written. So with that in mind, I really wanted to do a book that would be, I don't know, like the gateway Alice, sort of like the gateway drug, get them started on something soft, <laughs> something accessible, something for 10 bucks, how can you beat that? Um, and then really introduce them to that world of Lewis Carroll. Though then the other complication with Disney is they wanted uh, the book to also reflect the movie and stay true to the dialogue in that. And once I started rereading the book like four or five times, I realized like, oh, now I'm really screwed. Because <laughs> Carol is all about that build of slowly layering humor and, and really, I don't know, just writing it in the, in the deepest way. And then I realized, oh man, I've got like three sentences to pull this off. So I wanted to include the entire Walrus and the Carpenter. But a traditional picture book is 32 pages long. So you blow four pages on the Walrus and the Carpenter, and it's like, oh no, we're not going to get anything else in here. Uh, the other challenge was, we started with all the original artwork of Mary Blair. Um, is everybody familiar with Mary Blair or at all? She was a conceptual artist working with Disney in the 50s, um, and one of the only women, actually, who worked with the Disney crew. And in making the animated movies, they would draw their idea of the characters. Maybe four, or five, six, as many as a dozen illustrators would draw their idea of the characters, which the animators then all sort of took ideas from to make the final characters. So that's why this Alice, which is drawn by Mary, it's just kind of a rough. And the more I got to work with these paintings, I was just thrilled to see like how powerful these images are in their, in their roughness and in their first take on like what she thought Alice would look like. So that, that's actually kind of close to the, the ultimate Alice. But here was more what her Alice idea was. And Kelsey and I had a couple of images we actually decided not to use just because, look at those enormous calves. Exactly <laughs> like those, um, kind of the German Expressionist posters, where you see like the swords and the spades marching by. They're just, they're frightening, which I really liked. <laughs> and she did a ton of tea party stuff. So I think we had like three tea party spreads. We went nuts on the tea party. Um, also the, the flower garden, because Mary loved the flower garden. This was her idea of what the castle would be. See, now, here's actually a good example of just that it is conceptual art. 
Because I think I could draw that, Alice. <laughs> it's just a quick, quick idea of like what the what the woods would look like. And here's the man, her version of the Mad Hatter. He's actually got a green coat. When I first saw this, I thought he was like a purple humpback Mad Hatter. But that's his chair. <laughs> so if you look a little more closely, he's actually in deep. So we had to get a little more driving force to it. Um, and that became the Mad Hatter, who we only had three pictures of, so we had to kind of like fake that. But here's some great flower stuff. More gigantic calves, partially hidden. <laughs> oh, and this is actually a great example. This is a, um, it's actually cut off of what the full two-page spread of the book is. But it's an example of how crucial the design designer of the book was. Because she took the existing artwork, which were these cards, and then made them in that shape. Here's the full spread. So on this side are those dark, like crazy, mean looking cards. And then she kind of lightened it up with this, this sequence of the cards just flying all around. And she took existing artwork and then just kind of spotlit it and kind of did dingbats, just sort of designing throughout, just to give it a, a little more heft and kind of feature the artwork. Yeah? How do you uh, continue to stay in touch with kids so that you know that you're always, I don't know, staying fresh? Oh, that's a great question. She wondered how I, I stay in touch with kids. Um, a lot of it is having been in the classroom for 10 years, it just kind of sticks with you. <laughs> you just remember that, like, February, where you just can't go to the bathroom and you're stuck with all these crazy little <laughs> brains. But also, I do a lot of traveling and speaking to groups, too. So I think that really keeps me fresh in speaking to a group and presenting my stories. Focus your child humor crazy mentality on any of Carol's other words, like on any snark Oh, have I tried focusing my child crazy mental humor, I believe was the question, <laughs> on uh, any other Carol works? Uh, no, you know what, that's why this Alice thing just sort of opened up a whole new world though. And, and I think we may actually think about that. Oh, that's actually, I did, you know what? <laughs> I should probably show you this too. Because before the Alice book, um, yeah. I did a book messing around with math that became Math Curse, where a kid wakes up and everything turns into a math problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then the end of that book was the joke just like, oh, and everything was fine until science class. And Mr. Newton says, and I just thought that would be a good joke, but I ended up doing that book too. So everything turns into a science poem. So within this, I did messing around with some poems in fine Carol fashion, like evolution. Glory, glory, evolution. Darwin found us a solution. <laughs> your mama is that shape, and your knuckles always scrape. Gobble gookie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which I then took all the vocabulary from the back of Cheerios boxes and Oreos boxes. <laughs> so if you look closely at the Gobblegook monster, he's composed of all these different labels off the back of uh, packaging. And it's called Gobblegookie, which might be familiar. Twas fructose. <laughs> Did zinc and dye red number eight? <laughs> All poly were the thiamines and the carbohydrate. <laughs> Beware the gobblegook, my son. The vitamins, the added C. Beware the serving size and shun the dreaded B H T. <laughs> and then saturated boy, there's a little guy down here. 3,000 calories, don't look. The sugars, fats, oh, soy. <laughs> Twas fructose and the vitamins. <laughs> Did zinc and dye, red number eight. All poly were the thiamines and the carbohydrate. <laughs> Because when I read this, it gets a very interesting variety of reactions, uh, some of which being just pure 
goggle, you know, jaw dropping sort of. <laughs> is that? <laughs> but it is actually fun to read, and I love that kids pick up on that. And then when I explain to them that that is a parody of a poem, and it's a parody of another poem, then, then their little heads spin around. It is. But if we can sort of draw them in, and I think that's what Carol did too. By like, he was the ultimate storyteller for kids. So that was his mission to sort of make that so exciting and kind of, kind of make fun of their world of math and reading, reading and writing. <laughs> yes, questions from the back here. Oh, yeah. Well, Fitch, with, I'll just ask you if you're going to do anything yet. I, 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 I'm your shill, so I told you to do the <laughs> jam walk thing, but is there, are there any other heroin things in the future that you can do? Um, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head, any other Carolian stuff, but uh, why'd you have something in mind? It's <laughs> 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 so on the title page, sorry. It's on the dust cover. It's on the dust cover. <laughs> 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 Oops. <laughs> you can speak yeah. to Nelly about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's, it's that first way that kids actually discover um, in some ways, Alice or fairy tales. Though, yeah, I know it's sort of, it kills purists. I think, like, ooh, like that Cinderella is what they find out. And I, and I came to that later, too, but I think I came to an understanding that I think it's all right. I think kids are discerning enough that they can at least start there and then discover the true thing. Because if not, they may never get to the true thing. Like, kids may not get to the original Carol. I'd One more, yeah. Angelica. Oh, well, I want to, maybe this group doesn't know that you are our first ever yes. national ambassador for young people's literature. Oh. Wow, well, thank you. And could you just tell us a little bit about what that's been like? And I know you have a particular platform. Oh, yeah. In fact, I should probably show you my medal, which I happen to have. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so glad you asked. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> So yeah, I was appointed the first national ambassador of young people's literature by the Library of Congress just this last January. I, they had been talking about it for quite a long time, um, but it was just to have a position of like laureate for kids' books. And when they called me, I just thought it was a crank call because <laughs> I had never heard of such a thing. But it turned out to be this great opportunity just to promote kids' books, all reluctant readers, boys and girls. But it kind of came fast. It's perfect. Oh wait, we better get a little photo up. <laughs> some of the cabinet members, 70 authors, everybody in a black tie. And what I read to him was from my latest book, which is an autobiography um, up to about fifth grade, called Knucklehead, <laughs> which was just perfect, which is all stories from <laughs> me growing up with my five brothers um, and doing things ranging from tying Brother Tom to bed with my dad's ties and my babysitting him to um, my favorite story, which they asked me to not read. The librarian of Congress actually said, I don't know, you probably shouldn't read that one. So of course I told him I couldn't read it, but told it to him. <laughs> and it's the chapter, well here's the book, Knucklehead. Because that's what my dad used to call us all. Because I think he couldn't remember our names. He really. used to just call us all knuckleheads. Jay, if we can uh, have you stroll to the back. Uh, we have some copies of John's book, if anyone cared to buy them. They're $10 each. Perfect. And John will be happy to sign for you. John, thank you so much. Oh, my